where there was no correlation whatsoever with the TNT T ratio of the Lamoil River. So again, it was like dissolved nutrients. It appear to be important for controlling lake nutrients in those deep stratified parts of the lake. But this still doesn't answer that question of why we see uh, decreasing nitrogen in the deep section of the lake while we see increasing nitrogen loads to the lake, because that's true for dissolved constituents of nitrogen. So to answer that, what I think is going on is that it's actually concentrations of the inflowing water rather than loads which are impacting the lake nutrient concentrations. So the idea here is that you might have, we have increasing loads coming to the lake, but that's really being driven by increasing precipitation and discharge. But the average concentration of those of those inflowing waters are actually decreasing over time. Um, so here you see for Mounds Bay, um, the total nitrogen in milligrams per liter of Mounds Bay is very significantly correlated with the dissolved nitrogen, average dissolved nitrogen in milligrams per liter coming out of the oil worker. Similarly, total phosphorus in Mounds Bay is very significantly correlated with the total dissolved phosphorus in milligrams per liter coming out of the oil river. And you note that both of these regression lines are quite close to the one to one line. So not only are they correlated, but they seem to be very close in terms of absolute numbers as well. Um, in the Sisquoi Bay, again, we don't see a strong relationship in this shallow ecotic bay. No relationship here. There is a significant correlation between TT in the Sisquoi Bay and dissolved phosphorus from the Sisquoi River. However, you look, the magnitude is quite different here. So there's a lot more phosphorus in the bay that can be explained by the concentration of those inflowing waters. So that's kind of long-term trend, and what we can get out of that is clearly there seems to be some influence of dissolved nutrients, particularly on the TNTG of the deep segments of the lake. But to get at some of those mechanisms in the shallow sections, we really want to look at intra-annual patterns, so within-year patterns, and how those might be changing in response to either climate or, or other factors. Uh, so we know that you know, maybe longer trends are driven mostly by a process happening in September or April, or for a particular time of year. So we need to decide what those processes are. And we know based on what we know about limnology that these are likely very different in shallow and deep areas and the difference in thermal structure and the accessibility of sediment nutrients. Um, so just to give a quick picture of what within your trends look like in shallow bays, this is this way bay, and what you're looking at here is total nitrogen and flat overlaid over the hydrographic Mississippi River. So what you tend to see, this is just a few representative years, is that total nitrogen follows the hydrograph quite closely with peaks coming after major external inputs and then declining during the dry period during the summer. So this is consistent with the predominantly external source of nitrogen on an annual basis, which is then gradually removed either through denitrification or through sedimentation. Phosphorus shows a very contrasting pattern where you have, you may have some slight increase during the summer, but this is predominantly due to suspended sediment in the water column, and once that falls out, that effect disappears. Most of the increase in phosphorus that you get during the summer months are when you do not have external inputs, so this is consistent with sediment nutrient building um, when the water temperature are warmer in the summer. So of course, again, putting these two trends together, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio tends to decline quite sharply each year. It starts high in the spring, gets low sometime in late summer, and then generally starts to increase again in the fall. Um, and you often frequently get down around this line here to know the red field ratio, which is theoretically the point when nitrogen should be limiting. So that was in Sisquoi Bay, so we wanted to see how these patterns translate to other sites within the lake. So here you're looking at aggregated the entire 20 plus year data set plotted by Julian Dude on the x axis, and I've separated the shallow sites and deep sites. And what you can see is that the shallow sites all saw that pattern that you saw in the previous plots, where the entropy declines during the main part of the growing season and then rises again in the fall. Even though the absolute magnitude of entropy might be substantially different between these shallow sites. In contrast, the deep sites show this very consistent over the course of the season. So that suggests a really efficient nutrient recycling within these deep sites because they don't have the access to those sediments which are the source of both denitrification and of phosphorus release. So the one major exception here is the northeast arm where you do see this decline again to be particularly late in the summer with these squares down here. But I think this is really interesting. I mean, I think what's driving this pattern is here. This plot is a bit unnecessarily messy. We notice here that the northeast arm site is looking at dissolved oxygen. So you frequently get these incidents of hypoxia or anoxia in the deep waters in the northeast arm late in the summer, and this may be driving phosphorus release from those sediments late in the summer, um, which helps to explain these uh, low values here. Now, this, incidentally, this is a plot of long term trends in bottom water temperature and bottom water dissolved oxygen, which you see are both significant over the past decade. So to get a little bit of a closer look at how these actually relate to a few different plume years when we have high frequency data for the RAT project, um, this is just looking at again the hydrographic of the Sisquoi River with TNTP samples collected every eight hours and ISCO samplers on our on our monitor. 
by contrast, in 2013, we had the wettest month on record in late June through, or late May through early June. This corresponds to extreme high energy ratios in the week one year. 2014 was something intermediate. We had fairly late snow melt, reasonably wet spring, and a moderate one year. So we think that these, the timing, the delivery of nutrients, particularly nitrogen in the spring, may have something to do with the setting of conditions for the onset of cyanobacteria. Another factor that we think is important is uh, the role of wind and stratification during the summer months. So this is just another plot. This is from our our the buoy data in the Sisquoi Bay. What you're looking at here is essentially the difference between surface and bottom water temperatures on the y-axis. So you can think of this as an index of the calm, sunny days, essentially, when you have warm water sitting at the surface, cool water at the bottom. But these conditions are what you really need to get the pump of phosphorus moving down to the center of the water column. You can see again in 2013 was that year we didn't have much bloom. Um, and again, that's the year we had very little stratification. So just looking at how these trends are related compared to longer meteorological trends. Um, so this is just average changes over the entire monitoring period, split out by each month for each of these variables. Um, so we can see for lake nitrogen, you know, we've had this general decrease, but those, those decreases were relatively small in May, and that may be partly attributable to these increases in discharge um, during those months over the monitoring period. So maybe that increase in discharge has partially alleviated the drops in total nitrogen in May. But maybe it comes up. Um, by contrast, in lake phosphorus, there seems to be more of a clear trend. We've had these major increases on the order of 10 micrograms per liter um, during September, uh, October, November. So these correspond to a period of high increases in air temperature on the order of three and a half and substantial decreases in wind speed on the order of about 25%. So those, all these climate trends are consistent with what we expect to drive more intense bloom in the Sisquoi Bay. So just to recap, um, the deep lake, the uh, TNTP appears to be predominantly impacted by external dissolved nutrient concentrations. And the late season hypermetic ops, and oxy that develops in deep sites, so bottom water and oxy, in sites like the Northeast Arm, may be stimulating sediment to release, which helps to suppress those energy ratios in those sites. By contrast, it appears that TNTP in the shallow segments is predominantly controlled by temperature and wind, and by the time of the discharge of inputs, both these may be affected by the change to try and tie all of this together in a conceptual model, I think this is sort of my system. So in the shallow segments, we have both nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the lake and both dissolved in particulate form. So most of the nitrogen is dissolved, most of the phosphorus is coming in particulate. So the dissolved stuff is immediately circulated within the water column, um, whereas the particulate nutrients are initially deposited in the sediments, but are then released later in the summer when the hydrodynamic and temperature conditions are appropriate. But it's a much more dynamic process we have here in the shallow by contrast, in the deep segments, you have these dissolved nutrients very efficiently recycled in the upper water column, but the particulate nutrients are essentially lost to the sediments in the near shore areas. So as a result, those density ratios reflect the dissolved nutrient concentrations coming into the deep segments. So if you look at this over the course of the year, what we're kind of getting is again, we have nitrogen deposit ratio tracking both the hydrograph of what's coming in in terms of nitrogen and then the temperature curve, so how warm it is. And that results in this declining energy ratio over the main part of the growing season under current conditions in these shallow segments. Whereas in the deep segments, we have this mostly flat NP, um, which may dip a bit in the late summer at the bottom where it often depletes during the stratified period. But once stratified peaks breaks down, it pops right back up. And what we might expect to see under a climate change scenario is this hydrograph will be pushed earlier into the season, and the temperature will increase earlier in the season. Warm season will last longer, so this should push this whole curve here to the left from your perspective, resulting in earlier depletion of the nitrogen ratio, earlier drop into nitrogen limited territory, and potentially more severe blooms. By contrast, in deep segments, we expect to see a longer stratified period, so more time for that bottom water option to deplete, more potential for phosphorus release in these deep lake areas, and again, the potential for more intense blooms there. Yeah. So that's it all together. Let me talk about this one.
on golf using concentrations um, to the clusters in the deep lake segments. Um, but both dissolve in particulate um, nutrients, maybe or in shallow segments where they remain accessible to the upper water column. Okay. We have a few minutes. more than the total chlorophyll achieved during the bloom, so we might get more done. 